Hello everyone, so uh, my name is Selena, and so my talk is actually going to be slightly different than the other talks here. Um, I was, so my week was slightly chaotic. I had a friend who got diagnosed with cancer on Monday, and my granny died three hours ago, so I'm slightly out of it right now. But I'm going to give you this talk right now because I was really looking forward to it, and I both wanted to be here with a lot of people. So, um, yeah, my, my talk originally, the idea that I had my talk was to call it something like of bones and boners. Sometimes things are just hard, but then I realized that <laughs> might be a little bit you know, too steamy. So I thought I'd make it more, you know, safe for work. So I went with numbers, bones, and identities, and why we cannot actually divorce the times from the scientists. So I edited this by basically going through the. So there's two things that I do I am a scientist and I'm a trans, I'm a transgender. And so there's sort of these three main stages that I think both things sort of have in common. The first stage being, what exactly am I doing? So what am I? What am I doing? Usually followed by the question of, why didn't you get a proper job that actually has some prospects in life? <laughs> Secondly, how am I doing it? So how am I doing my science and how am I coping with being a queer scientist and still quite a male sort of cisgender dominated space? And thirdly, what are the results of my science and what are the results of me being very out and about in science? So starting off with what am I, so the over everlasting question. So if I wanted to describe my gender in a single word, it would be something like Who <laughs> <laughs> also known as I wish I knew, please tell me if you do. To sort of illustrate this, I have this nice little graph down here, which I got from Fantastic artists and the art, basically, which sort of very nicely shows that gender, at least the way that I see it, or other people see it, is a spectrum. It's not just binary, it's just male, female, it's lots of different things. And I think I fall somewhere around here. It tends to oscillate, so I'm a rainbow shot. I'll just go over the way, you know. And also, just a quick reminder to everyone in the room trans, the word transgender includes literally everyone who does not identify as the gender they were assigned as birth. So I was assigned female at birth, I'm not a woman. But it doesn't matter if I'm a trans man, if I'm agender, if I'm not binary, any of these things. All of these words are explicitly included in the word transgender, despite what some trans gay people might want you to think. Yes, some binary people are transgender. Yes, I will help them and grapple with you. <laughs> so, as a quick topic change, this is what I am, this is what I do. I work with these absolutely fabulous creatures, also known as crocodiles. Now, if you think of a crocodile, you probably think of your typical young alligator sitting in a swamp, crocodile sitting in a different swamp. That's the two genders, by the way. Alligator and crocodile, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm one of the ones, I'm one of 200 billion years old, actually. So, instead of just the alligators and crocodiles that we have today, and the slightly weird one, the gay male, which is sort of your weird DNA cousin, basically. <laughs> These are, you have, instead of the 23 species you have today, we used to have something like 500 different species, they're all shapes and body sizes. You have something like this, which actually in the official paper is described as a pugnose corner. That's the title of the paper, which has been flagged by reviewers as this is not real, but it is here. This is citation actually what it's called. We also have things like this weird thing down here. So yeah, overall we had a much, much increased diversity in the past in both things like species numbers and body shapes. We also had really funny tiny crocodiles about this long that ate insects, and which I would love to have this pet, but you know, <laughs> So, much like gender, is a spectrum, body shapes, and what we, we call it morphology, in paleontology, but basically morphology is a very fancy word of saying anatomy, also exists on a spectrum in crocodiles. And I want to know how are all these different species that we know about, that we've seen in the past, and that we have nowadays, how are they related? How did they arise? How did they spread across the earth? And how did all these different skull shapes evolve? And how did that spectrum sort of come to be? And for that, we get to the next part of how do I actually do this? So, how do we reconstruct these evolutionary relationships between different species? Now, if you're anything like the students I teach who come over from life sciences to earth sciences and want to learn some paleontology, you will you will shout, you will stand up and you will shout, DNA, DNA. That's wrong. Because we don't really have DNA. We have DNA for one of crocodile species and alligators, clearly. But even ancient DNA does not go back far enough for us to be able to use it to discern relationships between different species, right? So what we use is anatomy between different species. And I like to call this, we basically display a very fancy game 
of swap the difference, but the phones for adults. <laughs> and this is very simply how it works. It's actually, you know, I, I spent like, I, I spent 10 years at university programming my PhD, and that's literally what it boils down to. I play a, a child's game with bones and cold basins. <laughs> so on the left here, you can see an alligator. On the right, you can see a polka dot, not the entire thing, obviously, just a very strong part of the snout. And what we usually do is we just go through and quantify shapes. So you see on the left hand side, we have a bone called this bone here, which goes through the nostril, much like in humans. And on the right hand side, it doesn't on the photo. So we give these different bone shapes different, num different numbers. So we call this shape one, if it goes through. We call this shape zero, if it doesn't. And then we go through every single fossil that we know, and every single fossil we can look at and write down what sort of number of which shape applies to that fossil. Does that make sense? Perfect. And then you get something like this, which is the joint table with those of numbers. In my case, there are 580 different numbers in there, because I quantified 8, 580 different shapes in over 100 different species. You apply some fine mathematics to it, which I won't go into the detail to, because I know what you can see right now. And you get this, what's called a phylogenetic tree. Now, this is just a very fancy way that can hold it to say shit to show how things are related. So basically, this diagram shows you how things are related and how they so this is how we look at evolutionary relationships, this is how I do my science. But as the title of my talk says, how I do my science always intersects with my own identity and what I'm doing. So how do I use them as a transgender person, as a very out queer trans person? Well, mainly by being really, really frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my base thing. I'm just like constantly pissed off. Apparently I have like resting bitch face and it comes from that. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a fun fact. Every single conference and long seminar day I've been to so far, I have actually left early. Now the reasons for this are manifold. Reason number one, if you've ever worn binders as a trans man and have big boobs, that shit hurts, man. And I wear two binders. So I actually had bloody streaks down my side at the end of conferences. Because damn, man, like. And so secondly, I'm autistic. So dealing with people, I find it extremely exhausting. And that is just compounded by the fact that it's amazing how blind people are, right? So I've this pronoun that at every conference I've ever right? And very clearly, I mean, you guys can read this, right? It says he, they, right? These are my pronouns. It's right it's next to my name. And I've had scientists look at me during networking sessions and go, so what's she doing? And it's like, it's so frustrating. Like, I cannot punch them, sadly. So I just, <laughs> that's why I think it was confidence, right? Secondly, it's always that fun game of coming out. So and sadly, as I said, I had to visit the first session because I had to call my mom because my granny died. And so I was not sure if, no, if someone else talked about this, but this is a very often mentioned topic for everyone who's LGBT, it's a sort of topic of coming out in science. And the thing is, at least for trans people like me, there isn't really a choice involved. So to give you an example, I teach a lot. I teach three different courses at university, and uh, three, in three different years, so second year undergrad up to master's level. And every year, I do all the main lectures, and I see them like twice a week. And every year, at the beginning of the year, I sit down, and I have to make a decision. Do I write the students an email, tell them about my pronouns, and tell them that I am trans? And so this is a decision between, I cannot come out to them, but then be absolutely miserable all the entire time, and get misgendered all the time, like I was for 25 years, so not doing that. <laughs> Secondly, I can come out and just sort of open myself up to all the sort of transphobic abuse and everything. Like, I can see the stairs every time I walk into the lecture theater, and I'm usually not what people expect, especially going to be the doctor for the running in this country. So, that's basically that's the choice I have. So, coming out in my case happens over and over and over again, which you will hear a lot from other queer people. And B, for me, it's not really a choice, I just have to do it. Fun fact! Most students so far in the last two years that I've really been visibly out haven't really minded my pronouns so much unless they try and send an email to me and then they call me Professor Moro, which is really sweet. But, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> but they do get wrong all the time because my name. You, you will not believe it. I would acquit for every single time I was called Selena, Celine, Sel, Sal, Sally. I would be so rich that I wouldn't need another one anymore. But yeah. So yeah, good thing about modern students, they seem to be at least quite on board with the entire queer thing. So this all sounds quite sad and dreary, but as you can see, I still have fun doing my job. I have some lovely allies doing my job, and I genuinely enjoy it. So going back to the science again, that was quite a quick change, wasn't it? 
So this is what I get when I look at my crocodiles whilst I'm doing my job. This is what I'm actually doing in my free time, and I don't talk about being trans. Um, as you can see, you have this relationship to be here. We don't need to read the species' names, so that's why they're so tiny. But you can see here the different groups of crocodiles and how they evolved over time. So you have some current groups, alligators, crocodiles, gavials, so those still exist, the rest is all extinct, basically, more or less. And what is the most, the most interesting factor in this is that you can see that instead of all these snout shapes that look very similar being very closely related, what you can see is that they actually evolved multiple different times. So this long snout shape here, which is an adaptation for fish catching, so you're going to have a very long snout being catch fish quite well if you make it in the water, evolved at least three major times in all these groups, and then two minor times in sort of single species within the uh, crocodiles. And then, well, okay, so basically, you're talking about how I said at the very beginning, I did want to know how sort of these different cell shapes evolved and what led to their evolution. Now, this case is concentrated on the long snap shape. Oh, I killed it. Oh, no. Okay. I was going to make a really bad video of death and I'm crying. I'm not sure. So, I can actually look at how these me how the mechanisms, once I have that tree, I can look at the me mechanisms of how things evolved. So in this case, you can see this longer was trying to start with long shaped snout. These are all different species that have the snout, all completely unrelated more or less. And what I found out in my research, just out of interest for you guys, is that the mo the mode by which these long snouts evolve and the anterior part is actually extremely similar, no matter if they're related or not. And it's by location of sort of these anterior parts here. On the other hand, you have different modifications from tell apart the groups in the back of the cell. And I think it's just an extremely neat example for how evolution works, and the entire mode of how evolution works, how things can be optimized for the same habitat, like fish catching the same amount of life over different time periods. So these species here, this one is 200 million years old, this one is 2 million years old, so it's happened a lot of times. And so, yeah, a very neat illustration of how evolution works, I think, in this case. So, this leads me to say the following statement. In my opinion, Hold on to your trousers. The crocodiles <laughs> are way more awesome than dinosaurs. Now, if you were a group of paleontologists, you'd storm out right now. You are, thank God. Fun <laughs> fact, though, this sort of sent a sort of quite controversial statement in paleontologists' hands, still somehow incites less disagreement and less fire than mentioning that I'm a queer scientist. And just to uh, amuse you, I've compared the uh, top three types of replies I get when I come out as queer. First of all, the funny ones. So one absolutely rapping anecdote that a friend of mine who is in Cuba right now because I think he's still flying back from Mexico told me at one point was he went on a date with this other dude and this other dude, apart from being quite nice, you know, he at some point came up with the fact that it was so nice that we had more gay people in Peyo now and he was like, well, no, we've, we've always been there, we just haven't been out, right? That's all usually goes. We've always been there, we've always done Peyo, but we're never quite as visible. And the other people say, no, 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 so the reason that dinosaurs have feathers now and look so fabulous must be because there's more gay people. <laughs> <laughs> and it's my favorite thing, so I asked you if I could tell this anecdote. See, I'm telling you this one's sentence. It's my favorite thing. Secondly, so this is sort of weird, sort of slightly homophobic, but quite the other ones. I also had a really fun scientist who responded to the fact that there was like a showcase of the LGBT scientists last year at the Royal Society that I was on. He um, responded to this. Well, if nowadays we categorize scientists by the things they like instead of the things they do, I want to henceforth be known as Apache helicopter scientist. <laughs> <laughs> amazing reply. I'll say absolutely nothing to do with the <laughs> That's his name for you. Sorry, Jerry, it's his name. Secondly, the really fun ones of knowing your gender identity invalidates your science. So I had this one dude and I talked about science a lot and what I was doing and everything and he was, he came along for the entire ride. He was like, stats, yeah, cool, you do, you look at shapes and bones are oh, awesome, you do this and how great you And then at the very end, I mentioned I was queer and he was like, but now I can't believe your science anymore. Your science doesn't make sense because you're not straight and you're not cisgender. Why? And then, third and last, uh, just this might put a bit of a damper on the group, but uh, yeah, they're also what I call the assholes. Um, now, the one spot currently being taken by the person who told me on Twitter once again, and funny how they never do that in person on Twitter, is that giving rights to trans people is the same as legalizing pedophilia. 
That was a good one. I loved it immediately. Yeah. And then we have type four. Oh, this is my favorite. And these are the people, so I'm pretty sure all of you who are queer in any sort of way, when you went back to school, you always had this type of people, sort of not overtly homophobic, sort of like suddenly homophobic, like you know, the type of people who came around and were like, I don't mind gay people, they can do what they want to do, but like I don't want them kissing in front of me because it's like really disgusting, I don't want to see it, and it's sort of these sort of work. And these are the same types of people. Like, so why do you actually have to be so out? Why do you wear trans Why do you wear rainbow shoelaces? Why? Can't you just be like a normal scientist? You're say, well, why not? <laughs> and so this is probably the hard state of my entire talk. This is going to come across as these really pretentious by the end of me. Doing science, if you are any kind of minority, it doesn't matter what kind of minority you are, is inherently a sort of political act. And let me explain this somehow. So, if I do science as a trans person, science does not exist in a sort of cultural or political vacuum, right? Science is formed by the people who do it, which you can very well see, especially in evolution by all racist bullcrap that's been going on for the past hundreds of years in evolution. It's awful. So, if you're a minority doing a science, you inherently, out of spite almost, tell people who tell you you're not allowed to exist, to allow, you're not allowed to look the way that you look, that you actually know you're here, you're doing this. Other people can see you doing this and take an example in that universe. And it's, yeah, it's really extremely important to me. As my therapist likes to say, yeah, so then your main motivator in life is spite. And I was like, <laughs> if I can just make one transfer from at the mouth with madness, I will be fine. So yeah. Now you're probably gonna ask yourself, so what, what can you actually do to make especially transgender people, but queer people in general, more welcome in science? So first of all, I'm gonna get some flack for this, but remember that increasing gender diversity in STEM does not mean only making more cisgender white women into STEM. Gender diversity means getting non-binary people into STEM, getting trans people, men and women, into STEM. Or maybe you shouldn't always put just women as women are women, women are trans, it doesn't matter. But yeah, so that's something important. Also, get more people of color into STEM. Please, we wait to that way. Secondly, please do not assume anyone's gender. So I don't just become a stupid meme by now on Facebook, oh, did you just assume my gender? And I hate it because I, I've said that a number of times because people just did. And it doesn't matter what they're called, respect their pronouns. So my name is Selena. I'm not planning on changing my name because my name is Marlene. I actually like it, fun fact. It still doesn't mean I'm a woman. I'm nowhere close to woman. So respect people's pronouns if you're a somewhere. Look up people's pronouns. It's really easy nowadays. If you want to mention someone now, so go on Twitter and find them. Most people who are, I promise you, every trans person on Twitter will have their correct pronouns on there. So do that. Take that like one minute to think about. Thirdly, Normalize asking for pronouns. So put even if you're cisgender, put your pronouns into your Twitter bio, put your pronouns into your emails, put it on talk. So I have every single talk with my pronouns, but I'm usually the only one. Just normalize it. Make it just a standard normal thing that people do. Fourthly, <laughs> please put gender neutral titles and things. So you have no idea how many conferences I sat through, <laughs> not drinking or eating, because I was too goddamn terrified to go to the toilet. Because I don't want to go to the women's toilet because I don't want to be a Jew in a women's toilet. I don't want to go to a men's toilet because, frankly, cisgender men are bloody scary. <laughs> <laughs> and sorry for any cis dudes, but yeah. And fifth, and most importantly, don't be an ass. Be kind. So yeah, thank you to everyone for coming and listening. Uh, if you want to talk to me, you can get me on my emails. You can also follow me on Twitter. I also have a face, so I founded with a trans woman in the US who is a new scientist. We found a Facebook group that's specifically for trans people in STEM. So if you're trans and you're STEM, come join us. It's a very safe space for you to discuss everything and kind of challenge you come across. And if any allies and other trans people in STEM would like to uh, know more about us, we also want a Twitter called STEM Trans. So find us there if you would like to. And yeah, thank you very much. DJ. <laughs>